but what I've learned about myself, I can only speak from my own experience, is um, have courage because it is a scary thing to 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 do. Um, you know, uh, but don't let that courage, um, you know, divert you from. If you think you've got a good product, you think you've got a good idea, have confidence in that. And the scary bit is is naturally it it, it sharpens you. Um, so don't you know be overly scared. Don't get paralyzed by by kind of fear of the un unknown. Um, have confidence in yourself um, and always um, uh, have confidence in yourself and know the worth of what you're doing. Uh, and then um, you know you will work things through and things will 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 happen. And you know obviously work hard at it. Network, um, you know, build relationships. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Matthew Salter, and uh, Matthew started his journey in the UK, um, did high school there, and then uh, grew up in a military family, so uh, moved around a lot, um, ended up getting a PhD in chemistry in London, um, and was always interested in uh, the Asian part of the world, so uh, got a postdoctorate in Japan, uh, fixed or was fixed on a career in academia, um, but was also interested in a, in a career outside of academia. So kind of played uh, dual roles and uh, was a university lecturer and also worked in corporate, uh, moved around in the private sector to be full time and then uh, became a, a sales manager in, in Japan for a, a, a chemical company um, and worked in the UK. Um, I did that and got in touch with a, a major publishing company, moved back to Japan, running the publishing group's uh, editorial division. Uh, did that for several years and then was headhunted to another group uh, before coming to the US, US on a green card and starting a consultation business. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Matthew. Hi, thanks, uh, Devin. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Um, and when you uh, you talk about my sort of career and my journey, it's uh it's a um it it sounds like a sounds like a lot and you've just summarized sort of my life in in just a few minutes so so well done for that that's pretty really good um i have to say um i've just got my green card actually last year so i came um on a visa actually an h1b visa to work for a major um us scientific society as their um essentially their chief publishing officer um so that was how i got and that so i've been here since 2016 really glad and really enjoying our time Really glad to to um, you know be a permanent resident now and and hopefully looking forward to staying here for a, for much longer. Um, awesome. well, definitely so, yeah. uh, welcome you to the U.S. And now before we dive too much into the present day of the journey, as uh, the podcast focuses on the full journey, um, always great to rewind and unpack kind of how the journey got started. So let's uh, let's do that and uh, tell us a little bit about how your journey got started uh, going to high school in the U.K. Yeah, so as you said in your introduction, um, my father was uh, Korea Air Force, um, so the, the Royal Air Force, and and so we moved quite a lot when I was a, a small child and up into kind of middle school, and in my high school days, um, I I did those uh, in all in the UK, but I moved again a number of different schools when I was in the UK, and um, so in the UK, as as you probably know, uh, like America, we we tend to go to start going to college at around the age of eighteen. So at 18, I mean, I just had a, a pretty normal uh, high school uh, career. I um, focused on scientific subjects, although I loved so many subjects at school, but there's only so many things you can, can only so many, so many subjects you can take. So I focused on sciences and that led me to go to Imperial College, um, part of the University of London. Um, and I studied chemistry there, as you said, and I, um, I followed that up with a PhD in, uh, in organic chemistry. Um, and I was, as you said, I was at that point really kind of set on a career in academia. So the next logical step uh, was to do some postdoctoral work. Uh, and uh, this was uh, in the early 90s. Uh, and I had the opportunity to go to study under a great professor at uh, Tohoku University, which is up in the northeastern part of Japan. Actually, it's um, if people think back to 2011, there was a there was an earthquake and, and tidal wave and everything that's right around that area. So when that happened, I, you know, felt a particular 
uh, and I was in Japan at the time when that happened, I felt a particular um, attachment to that because I spent very 18 very happy months uh, uh, li living there. And so, you know, I was uh, obviously shocked as anyone to see that happen. Um, after I finished um, that work, I came back to the UK and I did some more work at Imperial College and eventually found my way. I found a position at King's College London, which is another college in, in, in the University of London, where I taught organic chemistry for a number of years. Um, I then transitioned to go back to Japan. So I've been going backwards and forwards um, from, from the Europe to, to Japan a number of times. And I was a group leader at the University of Tokyo uh, in the chemistry department. And, um, and that's where um, I, uh, I kind of moved on from academic work. And I became, as you said, uh, a sales uh, manager for a, um, <clears throat> a small um, private uh, fine chemicals company uh, based in Japan, a Japanese company. And I uh, was around their operation in, in the UK and Ireland. Um, let me and let me just from... dive in and ask just there one question because I think we sure. really chatted a bit before because I mean it kind of sounds like for a period of time you're straddling the two different worlds of being in the university and academic world as well as well as as well as uh, working in uh, you know private corporate world so you know kind of what what pulled you in each of those directions and how did you decide where you wanted to finally end up? Yes, that's a, a great question which I asked myself of course a lot at the time. Um, I think, you know, I loved being in the academic world. I, I loved research and study and new things and working with super smart people. And, um, you know, th there's nothing uh, uh, more uh, humbling than, you know, working with students who you know are likely to go on to achieve greater things than, than you've done in your career. So I've been blessed with working with some really talented colleagues, some great students. And I always wondered if, you know, uh, I loved chemistry, but um, the, the the, I was you know, the level of dedication you need to really be a superstar at, at, in academia is is incredible. And um, I, you know, at that time, it just seemed to me that um, I was in my thirties. I wanted to see if there was anything else I could do. I've always been interested in business, finance, and um, the public, the private sector as well. So I felt that you know, I wanted to if I was going to end my um, research career, I wanted to do it on a high. And University of Tokyo is one of the the, the best universities in the world, and in Japan. Uh, and then I had this opportunity to uh, to, to to really get some uh, great experience um, in a field related to mine. So it was to do with chemistry so I could apply my my specialist knowledge, but also I was going to get some great training and experience in, in corporate life. You know, academia, corporate life. These days, there's not as much difference as there used to be. But um, I felt that that was the time I needed to make the move for career reasons, but personal reasons as well. I just recently become a father. And so um, I, I thought that was a good time to make a move. No, yeah. it makes uh, makes uh, perfect sense, and uh, sounds like it was a good opportunity to you know end the academic career in a high note and get uh, it, and also get some uh, great experience in that on the the corporate side. So mm. you moved into the private sector, and as you mentioned, you'd uh, were working I think with the Japanese chemical country, out, or but you were based out of the UK. And then at some point, I think you mentioned you got into working for a publishing group or kind of switching in a bit of a different direction. So walk us through a little bit of mm. how, or, or kind of the steps as to how that how that occurred. Yes, you're absolutely right. So while I was working with um, the uh, uh, with, uh, the, with the chemical company um, uh, at the time, I, I I noticed that I don't know if we we're allowed to 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 reference actual company names. Uh, the company I moved into was Nature Publishing Group. Um, the group that's now actually Springer Nature. Um, at that point, that was before they merged. And they publish um, the well-known, uh, world-famous science journal, uh, Nature, uh, and they publish a whole host of other um, titles. And at that time, they just launched one uh, a journal, Nature Chemistry, and that caught my attention. And at the same time, they were also looking for somebody to um, take over running their custom publishing division, uh, which is called Macmillan Science Communication. Uh, and that really... Um, just excited me because I've also, in addition to um, my interest in science, I've also been very passionate about uh, science communication and communication in gen general. I've always loved writing, uh, reading. Um, uh, this is really before kind of social media took off, but you know, since social media was has taken off, you know how that can be used really to communicate to you know people who who are not scientists. You know how it's so important to get that communication right. I think we've seen this, you know, in in recent years, how communicating uh, efficiently uh, and explaining things to to uh, to non specialists is important. And so it really excited me. This division was a new division. It was just starting. It also uh, contained elements of business development, going to talk to customers, establishing those relationships, designing products, um, and also working in Japan and, and then subsequently uh, other parts of Asia. 
So that really was a, a you know almost like a dream job for me that I could, could bring all of my skills and and all of my interests together in that one position. So I was very fortunate to to get that start uh, in that position, and it really uh, has you know been transformative for me. No, it sounds like it was a great opportunity. Uh, had a chance, took advantage of it, and, and and worked out well. And so now, how long were were you at that position? Because I think at one point, you know, you had a um, you know, you went to another publishing group in uh, Singapore and uh, gave you an opportunity to travel a lot. And so kind of walk us through how long were you at kind of the initial dream position? And then uh, what was uh, the journey era from there? So actually, the Singapore work was um, was part of this position. So uh, I I leveraged some some and established some some big clients in Singapore. Singapore, if, if your uh, your viewers haven't uh, haven't hasn't been there, it is a wonderful wonderful country. It is it has so much. It's at the crossroads of so many important uh, you know parts of, of Asia. It has an incredible tech sector. You know, really highly educated population, and they they're so passionate about um, science and tech. And they really really that's a very small place, as you know, just on the very southern tip of Malaysia, um, uh, but it, it is an incredibly vibrant place and they really wanted to promote the excellent work they do there in research. So um, with my, uh, I led a team there to, to develop a website and magazines and, and communication strategies to, to help them get the message out, you know, um, that, 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 the, that it was uh, an organization called ASTAR in Singapore, which is a really premium uh, national agency there for science and technology. So that was fantastic. Um, so I, I, I visited many times. I, I, um, I've never actually had the opportunity to live in Singapore, um, but that was one of my destinations. I also got to to visit um, and spend time working in Korea, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, China a number of times. Uh, um, and as you mentioned in your introduction, since I've been a small boy, I've, I've really always been fascinated by um, uh, 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 the Far East and, and uh, China and Japan in particular. So this was uh, incredible for me to, to be able to travel around a part of the world I'd always been fascinated in, meet with really smart people, work on some incredible projects, and uh, that was my job. So, you know, it didn't really get a lot better than that. Well, it sounds like it's uh, pretty tough to beat and uh, pre or presented a, a great opportunity. Now, before you ended up coming to the US, yes, I think you also mentioned that you got uh, headhunted over to a different publishing group and did, yeah. a, did a stint with uh, another business. Is that right? That's right. Yes, I was. Um, uh, um, I was uh, when I've been in in Nature Publishing Group uh, for a while, um, a number of years, um, and then I was approached to to take on a position at the uh, Institute of Physics Publishing in the Tokyo office. That is uh, the Institute of Physics is is uh, um, obviously as the name as the name suggests, it's a uh, uh, it's actually a UK organisation that promotes and disseminates the work of, of physicists, uh, and they have a publishing division um, which is wholly owned by them. And and I was um, asked to run their um, the, the Asia Pacific operation, uh, and again, that really meant I traveled a lot more to China. At one point, I was in China every you know four to six weeks, uh, to the extent that you know um, uh, you, you get start getting recognized by check-in staff. Um, after a while, uh, I flew to Beijing, spent a lot of time in Beijing, but also had the opportunity to travel in many parts of uh, north, right around the country, which is always an, an absolute joy uh, to to be in China. Um, also, managed to visit uh, Korea again a number of times. Uh, and also uh, one of the really uh, most rewarding parts of that is when I was working at an Institute of Physics Publishing, they had a um, a partner journal partnering with uh, Science and Technology uh, Academy in Vietnam. So I also managed to to go to North Vietnam a number of times, which is just an incredible experience. And I was very fortunate to, to be able to do that. So, yeah, that was a great, great time. Great company. That's awesome. Cool. Sounds like it uh, presented a lot of opportunities. It kind of uh, g gave you the additional uh, opportunity to continue to expand uh, different experiences within the Asian area, which I'm sure uh, are suited to exactly or what you were looking for. So that uh, sounds like a great opportunity. Now, at some point, uh, you decided you wanted or you're going to come to the U.S. and start doing a consulting business and kind of do what you're doing now. But, you know, that's a bit of a, a leap, one, from publishing and, and two, a different change in location and different venue and everything else. So yeah. walk us through a little bit of how you uh, came upon that opportunity and, and what uh, led you to pursue that. Yeah, so that's, again, um, uh, you know, as you mentioned, it's wonderful to be able to, 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 to travel around Asia and uh, as well as lots of great experiences. I, I got lots of great Instagram posts out of it as well. Um, of course, it's a, such, a, such a photogenic uh, part, part of the world. Um, but the, the move to America actually was, you know, I'd never, you know, really, um, you know, if I, if I was going to work overseas, I'd already originally seen myself, you know, working and living in Asia and, and I'd had done that for a while. And one day I was on a, um, I was on the metro, the Tokyo metro, going to a client meeting, and I just got an email from a from a headhunter in New York saying, you know, we're recruiting for this position. 
um, for the, the top position in publishing at the American Physical Society, which, as your, your viewers may know, is, is uh, one of the major physicists um, societies in the world. And uh, you know, I was I almost missed my stop on to, to get off on, on the metro because I was so stunned because it's such a, a you know a prestigious organization. And so of course I you know I was very happy living in Tokyo. I had kids in school there. I had a great job. I loved working for my employer. I had a fantastic boss. And I was thinking, you know, but this is such a such a challenge and such a wonderful opportunity. You know, um, I never really thought I'd have the chance to come and live and work in America. America is a different size of stage. You know, so much it's so much bigger. You know. Europe's great, Asia's terrific. America is just, you know, another sort of dimension in many ways. And the opportunity to, you know, to give my kids the another life experience and and, and get education here in America as well, and for my wife uh, to come here and, uh, you know, make a, uh, a, you know, another experience was just something I couldn't resist, um, uh, you know, pursuing. And it came at exactly the right time, I think, in terms of my family situation. Um, and so I interviewed for the position. Um, they flew me over to, to uh, it's based in Maryland. They flew me over to, to Maryland for further interviews. And then lo and behold, um, they offered me the position. And I was, it was not really planned in that way, but it just came my way. And it was just too good an opportunity to miss. Yeah. No, it sounds like it was a great opportunity. So now walk, so that were, what period of time was that? Or, or when did that start kind of the, the journey over to, to the next stage of the, the of the journey? Yeah, so that happened, the, the approach and, and everything, the conversations were happening at the end of 2015. Um, and when the um, position was, uh, uh, when I was offered the position, of course, I accepted. And then we had to make preparations to come to the, the States. Um, and there were, you know, obviously there were immigration issues to face and so on and so forth. And we actually uh, arrived in the United States in February 2016. Um, I was, uh, you know, actually officially in position from the beginning of 2016, but I was uh, not actually in the country until the February uh, and then we we moved in uh, to uh, an area just in in Maryland, just outside Washington D.C. Um, and I started a daily commute um, on the on the uh, the what, the D.C. metro, right across town um, and back every day, um, and just really started to get my teeth into the uh, the, um, the the big responsibility and the fantastic opportunity that working for the American Physical Society presented. Um, your, your viewers may know that the American Physical Society publishes a number and a growing number of, of really high quality physics journals. They, I, I would still maintain, you know, there are many great journals in the world, but I think the physical review portfolio, which is what I was uh, in charge of, is just one of the great portfolio of physics journals and physics related journals. Uh, and I was privileged to, to sort of lead their development for a number of years. Um, and so we settled into U.S. life. We spent the first few weeks in an apartment hotel in D.C., a stone's throw from the White House. So it was amazing on the weekend and in the evenings to be able to wander around. You know, we, we would go to the National Mall and we would go to the Lincoln Memorial and, you know, just got to see uh, fantastic sights. And that was uh, my wife uh, and my children particularly remember that because it was between school semesters. So they spent a lot of their time just hanging out and seeing some amazing things in in the, the nation's capital. So really terrific uh, fun memories no oh, that's awesome so it sounds like a great opportunity and uh, a good experience for your family so mm. so now catch us up a bit you were, so you made your journey to the U.S. you know you had to figure out how to deal with and I've never had to deal with that so kudos to you as far as <laughs> green card and visas and all of those different things and figuring out how you do work arrangements and moving your family so it sounds like it was a an exciting but uh, a new, new step in the in the journey mm -hmm. Now, I think if I remember when we ch or chatted a bit before, putting words in your mouth that you can certainly correct, um, which is, you know, so now you've uh, kind of shifted to present day, which is you're doing a consulting business and kind of went yep. your own or path and decided to go down that direction. So kind of walk us through how you arrived at that and what may, what led you to, to doing that or that type of business. Yeah, yeah so the, you're absolutely right. So um, I was, uh, I started the consultancy at the end of December, 2021. So that was, you know, um, uh, almost six years of um, of working at American Physical Society. Uh, and I should mention during that time, not only did we get to see DC, but I was very fortunate as part of the, the senior leadership team. Um, so I was on the, the group that that um, uh, ran essentially the, the organization, not just the journals, but also participated in, in running the organization along with the CEO. I was very fortunate to visit over 20 states for, you know, in that time. So I've, there are a number of states, there's still 30 something, 30 that I haven't managed to see, but I've uh, been across the map and that was a fantastic opportunity too. And uh, in 2021, 
um, uh, the, we had a new CEO. Uh, I've been talking about how the organization could could do with restructuring in certain aspects and how you know we could develop the journals. Uh, and at that point, um, there was a, a decision. There was a, a very um, a major kind of overhaul of the organization. Uh, and as part of that, I thought it was probably having got to that point and delivered the plan for the organization. They need some kind of fresh people to come in and and implement that plan. And so I decided, you know, we decided it was uh, you know time to, to 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 strike out on my own. And I'm really really pleased to see that the organization um, has you know uh, has. They employ some new, some great new people. They're doing a fantastic job with that, and they're just going again from strength to strength. So, you know, it's a little bit like, um, you know, a, a envious of, of everything that's going on there, but just so pleased to see that you know what we worked on, my team and I, has been continued and is is really doing well. So I'm I'm absolutely delighted to see that. Um, and then, as you say, yes. Yeah, so um, uh, I was um, one of the things I needed to do was to be able to complete my green card process, and for that, you know. Um, uh, that the consultancy was a, was a help uh, in that as well, but also it meant that I can you know take on a, a number of different types of of, of project. Um, being in a leadership position in a in a uh, in a learned society has many many advantages, many challenges, and lots of wonderful opportunities. But there are certain things which you know you you, you can't do so well. You know you 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 have to obviously work with the organisation, and they have a particular um, plan and a strategy. And so that means you have to focus on those things. And there were other things I wanted to, you know, to try uh, and my, at my hand at an experience. So I founded um, Akabana Consulting, uh, Akabana Consulting LLC. Um, the name Akabana, um, sometimes asked, it means red flower in Japanese. My my wife is from Okinawa in the very um, southwest of, of, of the Japanese archipelago. And their prefectural flower is a red flower. So it seemed to me that that was a reasonable name. Um, and and so I founded the consultancy at the end of December, and you know, we've been going about eighteen months now, and um, things have been going well thanks to all my clients, and uh, oh. looking forward to the rest of the twenty twenty three and beyond. No, that's awesome, and uh, it's great because you know you always take that that leap from you know kind of working for others, working in the corporate world, and you you know you you can still do an amazing job, and yet you don't have so you know you it, it you get comfortable with someone else figuring out who's your next project's going to be and where the page is going to come from, and you can kind of focus on it. And to shift gears is always, you know, kind of something that, you know, can uh, provide a bit of opportunities and, you know, fresh perspective, but can also, you know, be a bit scary in the, when you make that leap. And so mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely awesome to, to hear that as you have uh, made that leap over to consulting that it's gone well and uh, presented that uh, opportunity to you. So... Well, now as we've kind of caught up to the the present day of the of the journey, it's always great to uh, jump over to the two questions I always have, or I always like to ask at the end of each episode. Mm -hmm. So we'll jump to those now. Um, so the first question I always ask is: Along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? What did you learn from it? Um, well, I've only been in um, working for myself for eighteen months, so um, I'm sure uh, I, I've you know I've got more ex more uh, mistakes to make. Uh, um, obviously, we don't try to do them, but you're, as you're, the question implies, yeah, the important thing is you you learn from things. Um, but if I can look back at you know earlier in my career as well, um, I think for myself, one of the um, the things which I I wouldn't say regret, but you know I think was uh, something I would potentially do differently. Um, is at various points in my career, I've had opportunities to um, to um, you know make a really um, bold move, and at the time I was I felt too unsure to make that move. I'll give you an example. In the late nineties, I had the opportunity to join um, a company which is a, a regional division of a, of a major pharmaceutical company, uh, and based in Beijing. And for a number of reasons, and it took me a long time to come to the decision, I decided to stay where I was and not take that opportunity on. And uh, that was just before the Chinese economy really started to take off. And I often wonder, um, you know, what that would have, um, you know, led to had I taken that choice. And I think it's important not to sort of beat yourself up too much about these things, um, because when you take a decision, you know, uh, normally we take the decision at the time because we think it's the only decision that's available to us. We, you know, we, we don't deliberately make bad decisions. Um, I the, the years between were gainfully used, and I, I, as I've just said, I had a lot of great opportunities there. But sometimes I wonder where would I be now? Um, you know, at what stage of my career? Uh, what would I've gained from from seeing that development in China? Um, so, but that's something earlier in my career. 
more recently, uh, since I've become uh, a business owner, I think what I learned from last year, my first year was I was very fortunate that I had a number of great clients, um, both at society publishing, uh, uh, working uh, to do um, blog posts and PR and explainer um, and uh, uh, educational type work with some um, tech companies and working for doing some market research. So a whole raft of things which built new experiences, you know, honed new, honed existing skills. The thing I think I didn't, I would have done better last year is um, I haven't yet really perfected um, balancing business development with doing the business. And I think that it's it's a, a skill that, that comes, I think, with experience that it's great to have work. But you need to be careful that you don't load yourself up with so much work now that, you know, you don't have things in the pipeline and getting that balance right. Uh, it's not something I'm, I'm still working on. Also, scheduling projects. I don't I never like to say no to a, a great, interesting project. But I think uh, last year I could have um, done even better financially if I had maybe s scheduled things better so that uh, I, I had a more even kind of workload. Um, no, so those are things I think, I picked and I up think that's always uh, the thing that you know you kind of have to find that balance because you know especially when you're startup, small business, just getting started. You're always wanting to make sure that you have plenty of work that's coming in that you can continue to sustain and support the business. And so it's kind of, you know, I'd say that, you know, being in a service-based business with a law firm have a lot of the same feeling of, you know, I always yeah. kind of call it the contractor syndrome. It's kind of like when you build a house and you, if you've ever been through the house building, you know, uh, journey, it is one where they're always, you know, contractors are always running behind. They're always taking on more work than they can or keep up with. And they're always giving excuses and delaying. And it's because they've been through those lean periods of time. They've had the times where they haven't had enough work. They're worried that they're going to hit onto those. And so whenever a job comes along, they want to take it to avoid those yep. lean times. And so you, and so then, but on the flip side, if you take too much work and you don't take the right type of projects, all you're doing is making it so you provide a, a lower amount of service, you're not getting things done on time, and you're probably not be, or providing the quality that you want. So it is that that balance of yeah. finding the right amount of work, the work you want to do, and also uh, making sure that you get the work done and also keep the the pipeline full. So sounds, you know, I think it's yeah. a, a mistake that yeah. everybody makes and one that everybody has to figure out. Yeah, very much so. I mean, and and sort of um, as a kind of corollary to that, I think another thing that I've discovered, and I was, I think I got right last year, is to to know your worth. In a, and and people always say that. So there have been projects I've I've actually declined, which were offered to me, and I for a number of reasons. One, you know, would be because I didn't um, maybe feel that I could. Could, could do a good enough job and in, in one case I passed the project on to somebody else who was much more specialized so that builds a relationship with them uh you know they they they'll watch out for me if something comes their way the second mm -hmm. thing is you know just sometimes to be honest um financially it's not it's not really a great use of you know the, the rate of the job is too low and I think you know you need to be realistic but you know you need to re recognize your worth and you don't want to set yourself uh, uh you know uh, price yourself out of the market but by the same token you don't want to sort of be too cheap and, and 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 sort of devalue what you're providing and that that's difficult you know when you don't have a you're not guaranteed a regular paycheck saying you know i just really shouldn't do this job the, the, the temptation always is to take absolutely everything and i've been very fortunate i've had a lot of great offers um but i was you know i said i was confident i'm you know i'm going to politely decline this offer because for a number of reasons it doesn't fit with what i've, I've i'm doing now and so um that was, uh, I, you know, it, it, it took a lot because another thing that, you know, feeds into my story is, and I, I, you know, I don't know your background so well, but you know, my father was was a, a, an Air Force officer. My mother was a, a, an elementary school teacher in her career. So both my, <clears throat> and my grandfather before was in the military and so on, um, that um, I don't have a lot of ent entrepreneurial background in my family. Some people grow up, you know, when their mothers and fathers have run businesses and they're very, are very accustomed and comfortable with, the kind of cycles you get in business. Well, you know, I never had that um, in, in terms of that. And, and so for me, you know, I'm like the first person who's ever started a business in my family. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, you know, there's that kind of cultural concern uh, that I have in, in, in my background, but um, it's something which you just have to, um, uh, you'd have to work on and, um, you know, learn from and be confident in your decision. As long as you're making the decision, you know, for a sensible reason uh, and, and for a good reason and not because, you know, you're you're, you're scared or you're, you're overconfident, whatever it is. I think you just then have to say this was a good decision. 
and um you know we'll see what the outcome is and uh you know that's uh that's been scary um but i think it's i've learned and it's a it's a it's almost a cliche i've learned so much about myself actually in the last 18 months um some good things some bad things we'll work on the things which need to be changed um but proud of of um you know what's gone on so far so no, that's awesome that's a... and and, uh, <laughs> and that segues uh great uh, is a great segue to the second question which i always ask which is now if you're or looking back and or giving advice to somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business what would be that one piece of advice you'd give them wow i mean you know and i've been i mean i'm a relative newbie at this um so so in just 18 months but what i've learned about myself i can only speak from my own experience is um have courage because it is a scary thing to 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 do um you know uh but don't let that courage um you know divert you from if you think you've got a good product you think you've got a good idea have confidence in that and the scary bit is is naturally it, it, it sharpens you um so don't you know be overly scared don't get paralyzed by by kind of fear of the un unknown um have confidence in yourself um and always um uh have confidence in yourself and know the worth of what you're doing uh and then um you know you will work things through and things will 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 happen and you know obviously work hard at it network um you know build relationships uh, i'm currently doing some work and what i like to do with my with my business is um i i've always have a couple of projects which are pro bono and in the beginning i did pro bono projects a because they were really interesting and valuable b because starting up you know with, with no clients no client list no history it's always important to have to build a track record of work and you know people will give you pro bono work you know more more uh, quickly than they'll give you um a paid work if you're a, a new startup um obviously you can't live off pro bono work forever but it mm. really you know i i think i love to do that because i'd like to try and give something back to the the, the uh, publishing community and the research community but another client i'm working with at the moment um they're just fantastic people. They have a wonderful product. I'm learning a lot. It helps me. You know, I'm getting, I think the other thing would be to say is not all of your reward is going to be financial. You get reward from, you know, the work you do actually having societal good, the work you do helping you build contacts and, and that will take your places in the future. So, um, you know, money is what we do, one of the things we do business for, but there's a lot of other things um, that come to, into the bottom line that you don't always see. No, I'm, um, I'm right there with you. And I think that's uh, definitely some uh, great pieces of advice and then some uh, great takeaways. So, well, now as we uh, do wrap up the episode, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be mm -hmm. an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? So I have a website, which um, um, I, I think I um, was going to be displayed in this um, uh, podcast. It's www.akabanaconsulting.com. Um, you can reach out to me um, uh, by email on uh, Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W at akabana.com. Um, I also have a, a Twitter feed, uh, Akabana Consulting. Um, and also you can find uh, me and Akabana Consulting on LinkedIn. So any of those uh, those, those routes, um, absolutely, um, uh, you know, would love to connect with people and uh, please leave a message, drop a line and I'd love to be in contact with you. Absolutely. Well, I definitely encourage people to reach out, support a great business and if nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Matthew, for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you other listeners that are out there, if you have your own journey to share and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. So just go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show. A couple more things as listeners, make sure to click share, subscribe, leave us a review. Helps us to reach even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success. And on that note, if along your journey you ever need help with patents, trademarks, or anything else with your startup or your small business, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. We're always here to help. Well, thank you again, Matthew, for coming on the podcast. Thank and you. Wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Excellent. Thanks very much, Devin. Appreciate it.